meeting of the Board of Selectmen. I invite everyone to stand and join me for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Our first order of business is very wonderful opportunity to recognize Mrs. Carrie Crouch. Um, Carrie, thank you for joining us tonight. I am honored to have the opportunity to recognize you for all of your service to the town of North Andover. And I had a few words prepared. However, when I look at the recognition, um, they've said all my words pretty much. So I'll just I'll read the um, the resolution. This is a resolution of appreciation. Whereas Carrie Crouch has lived in North Andover for 65 years, graduating from North Andover High School in 1970, and whereas Carrie Crouch created the concept of and was the driving force behind the founding of the North Andover, North Andover Youth Center and Youth Services in general, and was one of the several donors who provided funding for the program in the first year and volunteered her time there as well. Whereas Carrie Crouch served as the Board of Health nurse for four years while also helping school nurses run clinics during the same time. Whereas Carrie Crouch has served as a member of the Board of Registrars for the last 14 years and has worked at the election in various roles for nearly five decades. Whereas Carrie Crouch started the first decorating committee providing wreaths downtown, was the president of the Board of Trade, chair of the North Andover Democratic Town Committee, and longtime elected member, began the flag committee and ran the Santa Parade for several years. Whereas Carrie Crouch has been an exceptional volunteer in the town of North Andover, dedicating herself to making North Andover, dedicating herself to making North Andover a wonderful place to live. Now, therefore, the North Andover Board of Selectmen recognize and honor Carrie Crouch for her extraordinary leadership, commitment, and selfless years of dedicated service to the town of North Andover. Thank you on behalf of the citizens of the town of North Andover. Presented by the Board of Selectmen on September 10th, 2018. That is so, <laughs> so wonderful. I would just like to say in a couple of words, um, North Andover is always going to be here. And it's very difficult for me to leave. But I have you all in my heart, and I wish you all the best. Oh, thank you so much given so much impact all of our lives. Kara is a great customer at Val, her and Kenny Ray, and it was just the beginning since it started, and she was always very, uh, well, very nice to my parents. Yeah. 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 I want to get a picture of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now she started the selectmen's breakfast. Speaking of, I know, right? Yeah, that, was, the, that wasn't on the on the proclamation, but it was. I wish good luck in your next stage. Thank you. Okay. I did all those potatoes. Oh, I know. I used to we do seem those to kind of before you hand. I know. All right, <laughs> cold hot. Andrew, <laughs> take care of my towel. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going before you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's close. It's close. it's close. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Thank you, Kara, for all your service. Thank you. Get a picture with her. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Quiet pictures. Oh, sorry, Frank. So wonderful. Good luck. You enjoy the Virgin Islands. That's Everybody said cool. to me, there's a, um, an election board down there. Ah, there you go. <laughs> they advertise that they have two seats available. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. No. We give a reference if it helps. Yeah. yeah. We can fly down in person and give a reference. That's right. That really helps. And I think we'd be remiss in not yeah. saying. Do say government thank carry. You to, thank you to Kenny as well. Absolutely. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. I will share that with you. That is just a great pleasure to be able to to do that. Now we'll move on. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Now we'll move on to public comment. If anyone's here from the public to make a comment, just no. okay. Uh, approval of minutes. 
we have the meeting minutes from our meeting August 13th and August 27th in our packet. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from August 13th and August 27th as written. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Introduction of new staff members. <laughs> Well, it's my pleasure to announce uh, that we've appointed the town's first community support co uh, coordinator, Deanna Cruz, who is sitting here in the front row. Um, Deanna will, uh, certainly will make a couple of opening comments and be available for any questions you may have. Uh, has a master's degree in community uh, social psychology from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, BA in psychology from the same institution, has had extraordinary background and set of experiences on uh, dealing with uh, substance abuse and, and other of social and psychological issues on a broad basis, base of clients in a number of different settings and, and brings to us an extraordinary level of experience. Um, she was well received by the committee, some members of which have interacted in their official capacities with Anna. She presents all the right qualifications and skills and personality and approach and energy uh, to make sure that this position is successful. So I'm very, very pleased to announce that uh, I have appointed Deanna Cruz to be our first community support coordinator. Thank you. Welcome, please. Yes, if you have a few words you'd like to. Good evening, folks. Thank you so much for this appointment. I'm so very excited to be working here in North Andover. Not as excited as I would be if I was moving to the Virgin <laughs> Islands, is it? Yeah. Lucky lady. Um, so, uh, my background is in community psychology. Uh, academically, my background is community psychology, which is about the prevention of psychological issues by strengthening communities. So, I've always worked at the community level. Um, I have done intervention, I have been an individual therapist, um, I've done group therapy. Um, but my, my biggest passion and focus is really uh, bringing communities together and understanding how we can support each other. And that's, that's one of the biggest challenges that all of the communities um, across this country are facing in dealing with all of the mental health and substance abuse issues that we have. Um, I'm just really excited to be here and really excited to start with a needs assessment and see what North Andover is really looking for in terms of support around behavioral health issues and how I can provide that support. I've been um, an instructor at UMass Lowell for over 10 years, so I'm very comfortable providing education and working with um, younger folks. Um, so lots of experience, and I can't wait to work with you all, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Any questions for Tina? No questions at this point. No? Not for me anyway, but, um, okay. but again, thank you for coming. I think you, you've got a lot of work ahead of you, and, it, and we yep. really look forward to seeing uh, the results, or like for instance, the results of your needs assessment, and then where mm -hmm. you go from there. So mm -hmm. um, we're really looking forward to that. And great, thank you for joining us. Thank you so for having me. Did you have Selectman Smidili asked the question of where will Deanna be located? I think well, she'll have a home base here up in the second floor. But we do expect that she'll spend time in the PD and in the fire station, the youth center, and the senior center. Over, you know, we'll, we'll work out what that schedule looks like in terms of putting her in locations to make sure, one, there's a visibility and provide mm -hmm. uh, the proper opportunity to help obtain information from those uh, various groups. All of those groups are represented as part of the interview process. Um, and so it's an up, so I would certainly expect there's a home base, a place to find Diana, Diana but in the long term, having her be, spend some time in each of those locations makes sense. And one thing that I do professionally now and have done for many years is work on the psychiatric crisis team. So I am experienced with dealing with folks who are in the midst of a crisis, a psychiatric crisis, which can include substance abuse crises as well. So um, I am available and open to um, assisting with folks in the community who are having a crisis and, and don't necessarily know how to handle it um, in that moment. Um, so I expect that, you know, I'll be um, on the road and out and about in the community more than sitting in, in any particular office. Well, that was the, the reason for my question. And mm -hmm. perhaps um, maybe you can enlighten us and the public. Because some of the issues that people will bring to you, of course, are extremely private and confidential. Mm -hmm. So when we see someone walking up the stairs and go knock, knock on your right. It kind of loses a little bit of right. that privacy. So how how will you address that? Or is you kind of sort of explained a little bit. Right. Well, we've spoken about the need for having um, an office um, in a location where it's it's not stigmatizing to exactly. uh, you know attend that office. Um, the the crisis team that I work on currently um, is a mobile crisis team, and I'm comfortable with meeting folks in the community 
at a coffee shop, um, a park bench, the library, uh, whatever it takes to make an individual or a family feel comfortable um, sharing. I also have, you know, 20 something years experience um, with home visiting and I'm comfortable with that and certainly in other communities I work in um, it's a partnership with the police department where if there's a, a concern um, I function in, in other communities in the capacity of accompanying the police to calls that may be concerning of a, a behavioral health nature so there certainly will not be a sign on the door saying come here for mental health help <laughs> it will will be much more um, proactive in decreasing the stigma around mental health issues because that's really um, critical to moving beyond any of the um, issues that our society has. And if they need to be referred out, um, you have your master's degree, but you certainly would have to involve a physician if it involved medication or treatment. Oh, absolutely. So um, we, we spoke during the interviewing process about this um, position ideally not being um, for the capacity of uh, counseling or therapy um, only in perhaps a, a crisis or unique situation. So really the role will be developing networks within the town and the region to refer folks out. And, and that's one of um, the, the, that's the experience I come with, having done that in the Merrimack Valley already. Um, I already know those contacts and, and have the connections of who, I mean, they're obviously not personal connections, but I know who to reach um, locally and statewide. Um, if somebody needs a higher level of care, um, maybe it's a child who needs um, day treatment for behavioral health issues or inpatient setting, kind of going through um, the referral process for all that. So what you just described, so will that, um, you'll, will you be offering services to the citizens of North Andover or just the staff or just referred to by police, fire, or schools? Everybody. <laughs> we're we're, we're oh, starting boy, broad. Really uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's step back into what the position was sort of described to be. The, rea the reality is um, that Deanna's primary role will be to evaluate and refer. Um, and that can be across, uh, based on the successful examples in some other communities, it would be cross-generational, uh, cross-crisis uh, issue. So everything from response to public safety agencies to a problem they see to provide support, uh, to make sure we have referrals to whoever they're responding to, to even crisis response to our own staff, as we do currently mm -hmm. with third-party company, if that's required. Mm -hmm. um, the Anna's job will be through that needs assessment and other sort of what we find out as the position sort of right. rolls out uh, to refer people, have the experience to be able to refer people to the resources that they need. Uh, she has an extraordinary background in that regard. So the, that's the primary role and, and I think over time uh, the services the community need will somehow uh, will, uh, will become more aware of the services the community needs based upon the Anna's own experience with who comes in and visits, and I'm sure we'll be tracking those confidentially and reporting them and looking at that data to determine where those needs are. I think that's the example that was used in Andover. Uh, over time, the position evolved to, to address the needs that were being addressed that, that they came in from the public. And so we, we would expect that it's going to evolve over time, mm -hmm. and that needs assessment will really help that. But, but yes. I do see initially um, folks coming for all kinds of needs, um, you know, some that wouldn't fall under the, the auspice of this work. Um, but uh, that's, that's kind of the, the nature of this type of work is meeting people where they are, um, finding out what they need, being the connection that they have to a person in um, the service provision industry and then passing them off to the person that they should that's appropriate to provide the intervention that they need so as we're you know doing the needs assessment gathering data um, this certainly will be kind of a, a, a more broad um, throwing of the net how does that go there's that say casting of the Makes net sense. <laughs> yeah, one, one question if I, if I could and again really excited that that you're here you know kind of communities evolve maybe not a fair question to start with but certainly something um, that uh, you you touched on which is the youth mm -hmm. how do you see do you have some initial thoughts about how this will kind of interact or inter you mm -hmm. know, kind of link up with the schools and and 
in, in that part Absolutely. of our... Absolutely. Well, I'm very excited that North Andover um, has already adopted the life skills curriculum um, in the schools, which is something that in my previous work, um, I worked very hard to get um, the other communities that I was working in to adopt in their schools. So you guys are ahead of the game in that regard, and that is wonderful. Um, so with the youth, it's it's really the same as with the adult. You want uh, with the adult population, you want to work on the prevention, which mm -hmm. is the academic, you know, in, in the academic setting. But you also want to strengthen connections. You know, it's really about connections, um, connecting youth to their parents, to their caregivers, and strengthening the family unit, the neighborhood, the community. That is what will prevent substance abuse, um, the worsening of mental health issues over time. So it's certainly, you know, for the short term, we're going to have to do the implementation of curriculum so that youth are learning the facts, but we also need to do the community building, and that's at every level. So um, making safe spaces for kids to have healthy activities that don't involve substances, educating parents about the importance of being substance free if you want your kids to be substance free and, and you know everything that's involved with that. So it's simple but complicated. So we work with them today but also in strengthening the community so that they have something to fall back on. So I just, I know the answer but I just wanted to make this comment and I'm presuming that you would um, agree with me, but anybody who reaches out to you, it is absolutely no ifs, ands, or buts confidential. It absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, not, well the only time that um, it wouldn't be confidential is if somebody is reporting um, symptoms of suicidality, homicidality, or psychosis. So if somebody is reporting that they're actively feeling like they want to hurt themselves um, or hurt somebody else, then that person needs to be referred for evaluation um, you know, to the hospital. If it's a case of psychosis where a person can't care for themselves, um, they're, you know, having hallucinations or delusions that are threatening their ability to survive, um, then that's another situation where I may have to notify somebody of what an individual, you know, not, not um, verbatim what they said, but the context of what's going on in that individual's life. So those are the only um, cases. It's like being a, a mandated reporter for um, children. You know, if you, everything they say is confidential, unless, of course, there's something um, that speaks to some kind of abuse or neglect of a child. Um, so it's the same thing. But other than that, everything is confidential. I'm excited, and I just was going to say, so you have an impeccable reputation locally. One of the Thank things you. that we wanted when we sought out someone for this position was someone who had a connection um, with third parties, because a lot of your job is going to be facilitating, connecting the public with resources. Mm -hmm. I was just hoping you could elaborate more for the people watching at home about Certainly. what your experience professionally has been locally in Certainly. the different organizations mm -hmm. and groups you've worked with. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm coming from the Lawrence Methuen Community Coalition, and this is a, uh, as a coalition, um, it is a group of folks in the Merrimack Valley, so Lawrence, Methuen, Haverhill, Andover, and North Andover, um, who come together to work on substance abuse prevention issues. So as a result of my work there, I was the Director of Substance Abuse Prevention and Education Services, um, oversaw the department that got funding from the state and the federal government to um, work on prevention in the community and in schools, um, made a lot of connections. The, the most recent um, really excellent connection that's been made is through a project with the Lawrence Police Department, um, the HELP initiative and also the HUB initiative where um, there's a, a lieutenant, um, Lieutenant Fleming and I have worked together to bring partners in the community together on a weekly basis to discuss um, situations uh, which are essentially individuals um, who are facing risk of imminent harm if something isn't done to assist them. And in the room, we, we convene on this weekly basis. We have um, not just law enforcement, not just prevention folks. We also have probation. The judges have, um, one of them has come, and, and they've all 
um, been uh, filled in on what we do. We have medical providers. We have substance abuse treatment providers. We have all these supports um, for homelessness and you know every type of support an individual could need is together in that room every Tuesday morning. Um, we're going to do it tomorrow morning. And what we do is present you know situation A. This person is experiencing this. And every person um, is able to present a situation. And what you're saying is, my agency has done everything I can, everything we can do, but we need help. And then collectively, you'll see the Department of um, Mental Health, various groups from DMH, and the courts and um, outreach workers collaborating on how we're going to find that individual how we're going to connect that individual to services, um, what services are appropriate. We've identified gaps in services. We've identified uh, programs that we were referring people to and they were actually coming out worse than they went in. So we, we're making tremendous gains by um, coming together and sharing resources. And the most amazing part is we have over 50 agencies um, do this no funding. We just have 50 different organizations come together all with the common goal of keeping people safe. Um, unfortunately, you know, we can't help everybody um, and that's difficult for some of the folks in the room, but we've made a lot of progress with a lot of folks. So in that, um, I've worked with Lieutenant Fleming and we're working out um, an arrangement with Lawrence General Hospital so that we can go in um, to the emergency department after somebody has had an overdose and, and hopefully this will extend to um, later on include people with all behavioral health issues that we go in there with our resources and by we two people not the whole team um, two outreach workers will go into the hospital and help connect those individuals to services right then and there and if they're not ready then and there will still review them on a weekly basis and offer support. So um, this is what I come with, is knowing the folks in these communities. Um, work very closely, obviously, with Lawrence Police Department, with the Methuen Cares Police Department. Um, I would worked very closely with Saban and Andover, um, and more recently in Haverhill with their outreach team as well. So when somebody um, comes to our attention on, on the hub team from one of the other communities, we already have the connections um, from that collaboration. So it's been really exciting. And in terms of social service work, I don't know um, if any of you are familiar with it, it's groundbreaking. <laughs> so it's really exciting. Hi, yes, welcome. I think this is so exciting. I'm so thrilled to see what you, what you do for, for the residents of North Andover and what you can establish with this program, since it's obviously new for us and mm -hmm. you've got amazing contacts and resources and experiences to pull from so it'll be very exciting to see that benefit wrapped to, Thank to you. our citizens. I'm looking forward Thank to you. it. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to acceptance of donations. We have a donation from the Groveland Firefighters Association in the amount of $200 to be used for operating expenses for the fire safety trailer. I'll motion that we accept the donation from Global Firefighters Association in the amount of $200. And we extend to them a thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And motion passes. Uh, next, we have a donation from the Atkinson School PTO in the amount of $9,937.70 to be used for the Atkinson School Playground. I would move approval <laughs> being the, the mother of um, Atkinson kids from years ago. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Being a member of the PTO, I have the check in hand. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, that's what counts. No <laughs> going back <laughs> now. I just texted Jim Mueller and said, who's coming with the check? Uh, well, that's that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to, to fill in the blanks, not that yes. you wouldn't. So the Atkinson <laughs> playground is part of the uh, playground master plan for the project uh, in cooperation with the Community Preservation Committee and Community, Community Preservation Act. 
the decision to upgrade 11, all 11 of our playgrounds before McAvoy was built, because that was already new. And this is one of the projects along that, um, in that group of projects that will be done. In the end, we'll spend uh, the same amount that we spend on other projects. Um, and that playground will be placed uh, how would you describe where that <laughs> playground is going to be? Between the Atkinson and the old middle school track, I would say. There you go. Okay. And so in this case, it's a brand new playground, uh, not going with an upgrade of equipment, but a brand new location because of where the Ann Brad Bradstreet Elementary, uh, excuse me, ECC is and work being down there. This will be a brand, brand new playground that will hopefully be fully constructed in I don't know, six to nine weeks will give ourselves a range um, as an extension of where the Bradstreet oh, School has been at. <laughs> just in time. Hey, it's earlier than planned. Um, so it's an exciting project. Yeah, just, just to add on a, one thing, the fact that the playground is going to be now right outside the cafeteria so that kids can go straight from lunch to play and not have to line up and wait and walk through the whole school is, I think, really exciting and something that's, that's going to be really fun for the kids. And I think everyone... The 10 seconds is very excited and anxiously awaiting that playground. So. <laughs> We've got a lot of exciting things going on. Over yes, there. we do. Uh, okay, now we're on to licensing. Do I have a motion to move into licensing? Motion, motion to move into licensing. Second. Uh, all in favor. Aye. All, right. <laughs> all in favor. Aye. All right. All right. We're in licensing. Okay. Uh, we've got just a couple items tonight. The first is a um, <coughs> application for a change of manager at the North Andover Country Club, from Stephen Core to Jeff S. Isbell. Uh, is there anybody here who could speak okay. to? It? If you come to the podium and give your name and address. Hi, I'm Jeff Isbell, and then. General Manager at North Andover Country Club at 500 Great Pond Road. And I'm petitioning to change of, uh, <laughs> have the change of manager from Stephen Core to uh, me, Jeff Isbell. Okay. okay. And, and can you tell us a little bit about kind of about who I am and, and everything? Yeah, so um, I've, I've been at the club for just um, about 15, 16 months, and uh -huh. I apologize that. Um, this delay and kind of requesting the transfer, but it's been I sort of hit the ground running with a million projects and had a couple starts and stops on getting this petition. So I'm happy that this is uh, finally taking place. Um, I've worked in country clubs my entire life, done some basically since I was 12 years old as a caddy. I'm now I'm fastly approaching 40, and that's the only business I've ever worked in. So kitchen, front of the house, you name it majored in education in college for about a month and then ended up in hospitality <laughs> so this is sort of in my in my blood okay. great well, well i appreciate it in our packet um, we have the full sign-offs from the police department we've got the um, all the applications here are filled appropriately are there any um, questions or uh, comments from the board if not um, i'll hear a motion Approval. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. Yeah. Formally. Thanks for coming in. All right. And our other is um, a request uh, from Merrimack College for 18 wine and malt licenses. Uh, and I have to say, I'll, I'll look to some of the former chairs. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, there's so let me read the date. Um, concessions at the Rogers Center on Thursday, October October fourth, from six to eleven p.m. Concessions at the Rogers Center Friday, October fifth, uh, from five p.m. to eleven p.m. Concessions at the Rogers Center on Saturday, uh, the sixth, from uh, five to eleven p.m. Concessions at the Stadium Pavilion on Sunday, October 6th from 4 to 9 p.m. Concessions at the Athletic Complex on Saturday, October 6th from 5 to 10 p.m. Concessions at the Athletic Fields on Sunday, October 7th uh, from 1 to 6 p.m. Concessions at the Athletic Complex on Sunday, the 7th from 3 to 7 p.m. Concessions at the Athletic Fields on Friday the 12th from 4 to 9 p.m. Concessions at the Athletic Complex on Saturday, October 20th from 6 to 10 p.m. 
concessions at the athletic complex on Saturday, October 27th from 6 to 10 p.m. Concessions at the Rogers Center on Sunday, October 28th from noon to 5 p.m. Concessions at the Stadium Pavilion on Friday the 26th from 1 to 9 p.m. Concessions at the Stadium Pavilion on Saturday the 27th from noon to 9 p.m. Oh, it's a long day. Uh, concessions at the athletic fields on Saturday the 20th from 4 to 9 p.m. Concessions at the Rogers Center on Thursday, November 1st from 6 to 11 p.m. Concessions uh, at the Rogers Center on Thursday, November 15th from 6 to 11 p.m. Concessions at the Rogers Center on Friday, November 16th from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. and concessions at the Rogers Center Saturday, November 17th from noon to 11 p.m. And seeing as there's nobody else but <laughs> us here, uh, is there um, any discussion or comment? Well, it looks like they're having Parents Weekend in the beginning of October. That's a pretty cool one. Just making a guess there. And lots of other fun stuff. I can certainly monitor from my backyard. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would move approval on okay. all of these items. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass unanimously. Thank you. And that moves us uh, to hear a motion to move out of licensing. Motion to move out of licensing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Out of licensing. Thank you. Okay. Now we're into consent items. First item we have is to a municipal certi certification for conservation restriction from Edgewood to the trustees of reservations. So, it, it, to give you a little bit of history, Madam uh, Chairman, on this, there was, as part of the Edgewood expansion project, there was a property previously known as, I think, the Rockwell property that was uh, north of 16 acres, somewhere between 16 and 20 acres, going all the way down to Lake Chickawick that was behind the property. The town had actually contemplated at one point through the CPA. Uh, of acquiring a conservation restriction and doing something with the property. And as part of the development proposal uh, where Edgewood acquired the property, they agreed if they were permitted for the expansion of the memory care unit, they would in fact place a conservation restriction on the balance of the property. The town has historically um, seen residents walk through trails on the property, even though technically it was private property. Uh, this now completes the process where Edgewood has successfully developed the property to a really first class a facility has done what it promised in providing the conservation restriction, which means that a significant amount of land, very valuable land to the town next to the water supply and one that's used also for recreation will be in perpetuity protected for conservation reasons. So this is a very positive outcome to that whole process. Yeah. This would really protect us so much around that around the lake. It's just we're quite fortunate that we were able to do that because we really got uh, a real town jewel in the lake and uh, the trails and everything else. Um, CPA and others have done a marvelous job, uh, or CPC. Any other comments? Do I hear a motion? No, all for it. I'll second that all. all for it. Oh, is that a motion? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll make it in the form of a motion. I, um, <laughs> yeah, I motion that we <laughs> accept the and sign the municipal certification for the conservation restriction from Edgewood to the trustees of reservation property. Second. Or to the trustees. Of I seconded it already. <laughs> I will just comment that I agree. I think this is a great collaboration and. and Example of a win-win. So that was very exciting. I was on the planning board actually when that was yeah, it's being no, discussed. It's really so all good. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. The next item is the appointment of Paul Hutchins as the ADA coordinator. Sure. Madam Chairman, it's, it's common the building inspectors in most communities serve as the ADA coordinator. Obviously, as the person doing inspections on property, it makes most sense. Uh, with Don Belanger uh, moving on from the position of building inspector um, and actually returning to the, the city of Gloucester, uh, Paul Hutchins, as the new building inspector, would be the logical person to, to fill the role. So we're recommending Paul Hutchins be appointed as the ADA coordinator. I would move approval. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. 
Uh, next item is to vote on co our comments that we would send to the planning board regarding the draft master plan. I believe we all received a copy of the draft. Um, and we said we would send our comments to Lori for compilation. I don't know that anyone sent Lori comments. <laughs> Um, I stand by the ones I suggested before, and everyone seemed to like that we'll do us a, a, we'll vote in the order of uh, what we feel is always. It's about priorities. Yeah, yeah. priorities, thank you. Yeah. So I think that pretty much says it all for all of us, though, doesn't it, for the most part? So the, the pro Any comments? <laughs> I guess you just want to understand the process because it's. Yes. It goes to the planning board, the planning board considers our feedback. They can make tweaks to it and then. They vote for, I mean, because this is a draft, so they can make their own tweaks and then they vote for the final document? The fi final document will be voted by the planning board in two weeks. They, they will take your comments if there are any. It doesn't appear as if we have comments, but uh, because the priorities are not, the primaries are action steps after the approval of the document. Uh, they will then can choose to do what they would like, and I don't mean that to be dis dismissive, but they can choose what they can do what they like with any recommendations you make. They could accept them or not. I, I meant even more broadly. Like, can they look at that document and say, we don't, just like we're making suggestions, could they look at it and say, we don't think that this is a priority and just X out a whole section in theory? I don't think that they but would. The planning board, yeah, that's not really, there's been several public hearings, so it, if you mean specifically your comments or the document itself. I mean the document. The document yeah. gets sent to the planning board. The, the document, that, the, the document that, that I provided to you to provide feedback uh, to me was the most updated document with any planning board comment. I would not expect much, if any, change. It really is the going through a public process to get the kind of feedback that we're providing the board a courtesy to give sort of your own, you know, individual feedback, meaning collective uh, feedback. So they could, but it is not expected that they would do that. It's expected that the document that you see may see some mi other minor uh, updates. I've provided a couple of sort of technical clarifications uh, as it relates to the document, but it's fully expected that the document, more or less what you see is what's going to be adopted. And so Selectman Smidili had pointed out that we talked about implementation at our last meeting. Is that, again, something that they get to make the decision about? No. Or it's no, us, it's we as the chief policymakers. Yeah. We, we take that document, we decide whether it sits on a shelf for 20 years collecting dust or whether we keep, yes. keep it and make it a living document. Yep. The planning board will be done under the statute when they approve the master plan. It doesn't mean that they won't, you know, they could decide to take up another master planning effort sooner than 20 years. But in large part, I would say, as it relates to the process of implementation, it sits largely with this board because there's funding the recommendations, you know, from it. This is the funding area. So, yes, they'll be done with this statutory requirement at the time they approve the master plan in approximately two weeks. It then shifts from what are you going to do about it? Right, which is your questions, and, mm -hmm. and the process by which is a decision to prioritize the items in that plan, fund them, and implement them, will be driven by the, the chief policy making board in the community, which is the board of select. Yeah, I mean, my my general feedback on the overall document was I might disagree with some of the priorities or the time frames. I guess if if you re represent the priority as a time frame, like on the table in the back where it's had listed the full matrix of recommended actions and it had recommended time frame and budget high, medium, low and difficulty high, medium, low or whatever. My view might have changed a bit from what's in the document on some of those items. I, why couldn't we do that in one to five years instead of six to ten or, you know, why is that really that expensive? Why is that marked as a high expense one or whatever? But I don't feel it's necessary to provide that feedback because we can just do that as part of the prioritizing process. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I wouldn't think, I mean, it's a very comprehensive document, and I think nitpicking it yeah. is not, you know, our, our job. But I, I, do have, I did have a question. I mean, I didn't see, you know, I saw other organizations like Friends of North Dakota Trail um, and other, you know, sports organizations called it. I didn't see anything about the Merchants Association, and, you know, I have this affinity mm -hmm. towards that group. But I'm just wondering, under economic development, why there was no... I um, you know just no call out to that organization that we have an active merchants association in town and um, you know I don't know maybe it was missed or whatever but maybe it wasn't not, not important but I was just kind of surprised yeah. that we didn't have you know some kind of a call out in there for that organization. I'll, I'll bring it up to see if there was an appropriate point to reference that you know that group. I can certainly do that. The other question I have is where is B and M playground because that's a big playground and I don't even know what that is. It's like a 40-acre playground. It's called B and B and M playground, and I don't know. You what have that to give a location. B and M. 
B and M. It it's listed in the, it's listed in the playgrounds, and it's called. <laughs> it's like the biggest playground we have in town, but I have no idea what it is. Here's a map. <laughs> oh, I have never heard of that. It yeah. probably is referenced incorrectly. Because we don't have anything at 40 acres on a playground. It lists. I mean, the, the recreation complex is 16, 16. plus acres, mm -hmm. so yeah. 40 acres is twice that. He's looking at page is 109. It, is it, the, maybe is it a whale trail? It literally yeah. says. Uh, town owned open space not managed by Conservation Commission. B and M playground, 39.67 acres. Yeah, do they, they have the map reference by any chance? <laughs> I'm better with maps. A visual learner. No. no, it's not even the high school. No, the high school is called out separately. And the high school is not that big. Let me no. check out with B and M. <laughs> well, it may, uh, the only reason I say B and M, Boston and Maine, is it a yeah. whale trail? Oh, yeah. 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 But why would they call it a playground? No, the whale trail is a playground. Was it a potential it? playground? Mm -hmm. Page 109. But it's not showing it graphically in one of the maps. Yeah, I didn't see it graphically either. That was why I was Okay, I'll, make a, I'll try to chase down and I'll let you know what B&M means. We'll have discovered a new recreational complex of 40 acres. The only we, have, we, were too, we could use some additional open space and playground space. I think 40 acres would do it. As long yeah. as you don't have to mow it. <laughs> the only other question I had was yep. on page 94. They talked about some of the major intersections in town, and I didn't see the, uh, the common circle called out as that. And I think that was, I'm not sure if that's the appropriate place to do it because it's talking about transportation at that point, but they were just kind of highlighting some major intersections on page 94, and I didn't see, I mean, to me, that's a, that's a pretty, you know, yeah. major intersection in town. Typically, major. these plans would be talking about signalized, okay. so it could be the lack of signal, but, but I, let me see if we can make a reference to the space that's not signalized. It's not on page 109 in my, obviously. No, it's impossible. You know what? Hmm. It's on page 109 in the PDF, but it looks like it's page 102 in the printed copy. Yeah. So B&M is 102? Yep. B&M Playground, yeah. B I'm sorry, I was looking at the bottom of the PDF page. 102. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'll send you some clarification. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's a pretty big space that none of us know about. We don't have anything that looks like 40 acres. So. Sounds like it's more, more, anyway, I won't guess. Sounds like it's more likely some kind of conservation space than it is recreation space, because mm -hmm. our active recreation spaces are nowhere way near that size. Hmm. But it could be conservation. We'll look into it. Hmm. And if we've just got a new field, we can... <laughs> put some soccer fields field. there. Put some soccer fields there, exactly. Put some soccer fields. <laughs> took over a piece of Foxford. <laughs> That, would, that alone would be a major benefit oh. of this. <laughs> right. Implement that <laughs> first. <laughs> Expand recreation space, B&M Playground, 40 acres. <laughs> Number one on the priority list. I put my money on Boston and Maine Rail Trail. Well, I think, you know, it, it really comes down to now, it's like, okay, the baton is now, let's hand it off, and we start running with yeah, it. And, so. and the planning board really then moves to being a, a consultant with a lot of that, given their experience with it, and sort of the, those groups here. So, yeah, I think I think that's really it is you know, figuring out kind of how, how to go with it. So, I like the concept of of organize how you would look to kind of organize that implementation. And I guess I, I would just you know um, you know ask you as, as as town manager and as our we're looking for whoever the new economic development uh, person is that give us some ideas as to how you would, you know, look at us going about this, you know, how to kind of, how, to, how so to take a bite at the apple. You have an thing. opinion and then you guys can figure out whether you agree. What's the Fox, the Middleton line? What do you mean we walk? I'm not going to guess on 40 acres. That's it. I don't know. It's a good, good. We can all put in a guess and see if it's a good Put a poll. Um, it said it was taken from the north. But where it says recreation space, that's 2016. It doesn't mm -hmm. say, like, conservation. Probably. Like, we, we took Shop. conservation restriction Shop. on Shop. the former Bruin farm space on the Boxford line, but that was, that was a conservation of a CR. So given the size, it sounds okay. more like a CR than it does a recreation mm -hmm. space, but we'll, we'll let you know. 40 acres. Yeah, it's, it's the airport. That's what it is. 
open recreation in between flights. Okay. So I will I'll send you an email on that. So I assume the way we're proceeding is that um, we'll notify the board that there was although the board uh, that, that the selectmen have some in, will have some interest certainly in working toward developing a priority plan that may or may not be in line with the appendix. Um, that as relates to substantive comments to the actual report, the board's good. Mm -hmm. So yes. we'll send some yes. correspondence. I'll prepare something to be sent off to uh, Aton and, and the planning board. Great. Great. And then we'll let you know if there's any reason to come back to the meeting after the 24th and let you know if anything, there's any bumps in the road, but we're not <laughs> expecting them. Okay. But right. in the meantime, I will we'll give you an answer to those specific questions. Okay. And also, I didn't know that your section of town down by the library had a special name. I can't find it. I can't remember the name, but it's what the, Tavern Acres or yeah, yeah. I didn't know that was a special Tavern Acres. I didn't know there was that name. The, it name. was given a special name. We should memorialize that somehow in a sign or something. It's, um, or at least I don't know. It's it's the. Um, Property around Patriots well, Park. Patriots Park, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you're right in the middle of that, then. I'm actually not. I just miss it, which is really strange. It's um. Literally it's just Brad Street and Brad Street Road, Tavern mm -hmm. Road. It's pretty much pretty much it. Um, maybe my next door neighbors, house. but for whatever reason, which is really strange, my house was not part of it. I never knew that that exist that designation existed until I read through this. So that was pretty cool. It was donated by the Stevens family. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so then we can move on to governmental reports. Uh, Andrew, if you have anything. I don't make my comments under a uh, town manager's report. Yeah, okay, we can, we can move down okay. there. That's the next thing. On the <laughs> it seems logical in the flow sure. thing. So we are uh, moving forward with the strategic planning session. It's coming up. Um, Obviously, the folks are aware of that, our annual strategic uh, planning process. We have uh, developed, Lynn Savage has developed uh, the budget calendar, believe it or not, for the upcoming year. It's, it's not, not the best day when we're reviewing a budget calendar, you know, this far in advance, but this the process does begin shortly, so uh, we've given a copy of that to the Finance Committee. I'll, I'll send a copy along to you folks as well. It gets us between here and town meeting on May 14th, so it travels a little bit of a distance. but. We're starting to crank up that process, and so we'll have the strategic planning session, and coming out of that uh, sometime during the month of December, you folks will have to approve the budget policy document, which is the sort of the driving, the sort of kickoff to the budget and capital process. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Um, we are continuing, uh, you know, the process to, to replace um, Ray, which will be difficult to do, and I think that's a good point to, for me to stop and recognize the efforts that Ray has made over the how many years now? 17, 2001. Next so Monday, 17. next Monday, 17 years. Um, uh, we very much appreciate it. I think Ray has helped me a lot, uh, certainly at a very personal level, transitioning from, you know, one particular government to this one, provides that kind of historical perspective, has for the last couple of years um, owned and shepherded and delivered on uh, probably the most significant um, improvements to our public facilities, one of which uh, probably the greatest heartache were the last two, I think, maybe, um, certainly. Second to the last, Second to the last <laughs> two. And so it's I know they've been difficult. Finished. So I, I certainly wanted to uh, publicly identify Ray's efforts and say that I very much appreciate it. Um, and I've learned a lot, and, and you will be missed. And I wanted to let you know that. More to follow, but that's it for now. That's all we give you for now. Yeah, we appreciate it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Great. All right, I guess we're down to selectman comments. Yeah, um, it was actually more uh, a follow-up to the town manager. Just a couple of things that have um, been brought to my attention that I thought it would be good to maybe talk about a little bit. Um, we did get a response from the GLSD as to what the problems were and what the fix is going to be in an email from somebody Yeah, we received something the other day that it, they were working on um, a, a long-term upgrade, which they thought would overall mitigate uh, the impact of the backflows, the CSO events that are happening into the river, and then had some issues in terms of implementing that long-term capital, you know, fix. I don't think it's going to solve. Uh, CSOs will always occur, meaning combined sewer flows is a function of heavy rains into the sewer system. Mm -hmm. But the steps that they've taken through this process more recently will 
uh, mitigate, the, mitigate those and reduce them. They will reduce the number of power outages as well, which were caused the most dramatic events uh, back in, I think, October, right? Yeah. Um, and we'll reduce um, some of those. You know, I'm going to take a little bit of a wait and see on that to make sure that the okay. sort of follows through. But certainly the improvements that more recently implemented will significantly reduce the likelihood of the CSOs driven by power outages when, this, when the pump stops and therefore the CSOs are more common. And it sounded like the recent event occurred because they were doing a maintenance. So they were changing right. a major valve, yeah, major and they mm -hmm. they tried to, in the process of doing that, they needed to shut down flow into that Correct. into that chamber, and it caused a back. It was a safety thing. It seemed, it seemed like it was starting yes. to be a safety issue for the workers in there, so they had to release it. So, yeah. So I think so. What's changed in the last? A little under a year, I believe, maybe a little over a year. Is you, we now receive automated emails when there's a CSO event. The board has forwarded those. I know up and down the river those are communicated to the various communities that may be impacted by the CSOs. Again, that's a combined sewer overflow event when heavy rains from combined sewer and drain lines um, impact the GLSD to such a degree that that the waste backflows into the river. CSO events happen in combined sewer. Uh, drain systems, I think I once read, uh, are in 277 communities in the country, mostly in the northeast and, and um, somewhat in the uh, up near the Michigan area where newer systems, they've separated those two and they'll continue to occur. Uh, not every system will be split. Drain lines still will be shared with sewer and cause some of the problems. But, but in our case, ours aren't. We don't yeah, we, we, waste. We don't, we don't contribute to the CSO. We've got some contributing factors. We won't get into too technical detail, but things like what we call I and I, where basically infiltration and inflow, where uh, drain water seeps into the drain systems through poor connections or porous lines, that can add to that. But we don't contribute in the form of combined systems, which are one of the bigger factors that contribute to that. So heavy rain, the, and people should know, the GLSD is certainly adequate enough, more than adequate, to take all of our waste load. It's not as if it's at full capacity. It's just when you overwhelm that, if you can imagine, say, two inches of rain on top of what the normal flow is, that, that overwhelms even a system that is um, more than large enough to deal with a typical waste flow. So it's not like that district is at capacity for normal the normal flow of waste is when you add the water to it that can, adds to the problem. And there were several other waste sites upriver, so yes. not towards Newbury Pope, but rather towards a little beyond, that they have the same, even if it's not as the yeah, same Yeah, Lowell has the same problem. Where they're yeah. pumping it in, and there are communities downriver from that site mm -hmm. that actually pull drinking water from the river. There yes. aren't any communities after the Great Alarm Sanitary District that pull drinking water from it. I do not believe that's the case. No, because April pulls from Canosa, and all the other communities don't pull from like that. pulls from them. But they're north, they're upstream. Yeah. So, so when we have an overflow, when our yeah, regional that, facility has an overflow, we're not we're not endangering the lives of anybody. We're not endangering anybody's drinking water. We're not compromising drinking water. Whereas, the ones farther upstream, which don't seem to get as much attention, um, well, I think are prior to like the yeah. intake in Lawrence and the intake in Methuen and the intake in yeah in Andover. Um, I believe the attention is consistent with where you live, if that makes sense. So the folks impacted by our CSO events are the ones who are more aware of our CSO events. And I'm sure that if you're just south of the Lowell facility, as an example, you probably are, but we won't hear from them because we're not impacting them. So it sort of makes sense. I mean, I know there's a fair amount of conversation about it. It should continue. In the long term, what we do with stormwater is it's the hot topic. Um, certainly, I would say nationally, and there are magazines about it, there are reports about it. Stormwater management is, is um, signif it's a significant uh, talking point and action point for the federal government and state government. And so we'll continue to talk about these things until you know, we, we improve our response to them. I was present at a, uh, um, I was, I was at a presentation in which um, the DEP identified where the CSOs were. Uh, say 10 years ago, reverse where they are today, and they've been dramatically reduced. Uh, but we'll continue to work on those things. The other question that was brought to my attention, I already asked, but asked you, but I thought it might be good for the public to be aware of, is the um, the surcharge. Um, oh, sure. The, go ahead. You know, so the board. The uh, so the, so there's a surcharge at the time. Um, uh, that we, we undergrounded the lines around the common and came further off the common. Um, when, when the board, when, uh, 
adopted my recommendation that we begin phase two, which is the undergrounding of Main Street. That reinitiated initiated the surcharge on the electricity bills mm -hmm. because that's what funds it. So your undergrounding projects are funded by customers. And so I think it was back, oh God, a year ago, April maybe, somewhere in that range, and I apologize, I didn't uh, look when the vo board voted to stop that phase of the project. It was shortly after that they would have reinitiated that. So customers will receive, see a small surcharge on the bottom of the bill. I just met with a group of seniors and described that to them as well, I think, last week. They'll see that surcharge, and those dollars go directly to fund what ultimately will be a multiple million dollar project to underground the wires along Main Street going from Merrimack Street down to close to Sutton Street and portions of the side streets. So the board of Suckman approved that a year ago, April. I'm close. I know I'm close on that date. I've lost my memory a little bit on it. And that's what that search has is. It funds that process. The one thing I've noticed, you know, just coming back from the vacation months as you travel in, you know, some communities that are considerably smaller than ours that have underground utilities in their downtown, what a yeah. difference it makes. And they have the attractive lighting. It's painful to go through it financially and installing, but I'll tell you, what a, what a difference. I mean, communities far smaller than ours, maybe half the size or less, and in their small, quaint little downtowns, it really has a nice impact. So the, the outcome will be great. I think uh, Ray can probably speak to this better than others, but the, the reality is very few communities that do not have municipal plants where the process would be controlled really internally um, have been, you know, worse, have been successful in undergrounding wires. Uh, North Andover is experience through the common project, I'll just leave it as experience, multiple year experience shows quite frankly how challenging it is. So when you see undergrounding projects like that, uh, and we did a fair amount of research heading into phase two. Uh, those projects that have happened more expeditiously or more common are happening in places where the local government is also the electrical facility. Yeah. Therefore, they do the engineering. By the way, if it helps the ratepayer any, it's in that case, it's still the ratepayer paying because they're paying it through those particular bills. But the process is more efficient. Uh, getting the utilities to focus on undergrounding our wires when we're not the utility is a far more challenging process. We've had several meetings today. The engineering will take, you know, a couple of years. The implementation will take a couple of years. So it's a, it's a fairly lengthy process. And again, the ones that have been uh, that can do that quicker and more efficiently are typically when they also are the local light plant because then they would be the ones doing the work. So we're surcharging now and in Yes. Racking up the funds in order to do this in five years or something? I'm not sure I would call racking up the funds. But we, we the dollars are set aside for the express purpose of offsetting the costs. So the first phase of cost would be an engineering process. That's still on a project this size will be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the surcharge takes, we've got the last surcharge was 10 plus years, I think. We still have a balance on, on one of them. It takes that long to accumulate enough mm. dollars to offset the cost of these projects. So yeah. when were we thinking of doing this? I'm sorry, I can't remember. We started the project. The Board of Suckman voted the project mm -hmm. in 2017. I, again, I apologize if I'm off. Mm -hmm. I believe it was last spring. The board voted to authorize us to notify the utilities mm -hmm. that we were going to begin the undergrounding of the Main Street corridor. Mm -hmm. That process has had a couple of meetings. The utilities are aware of what's going on. They reinstituted the search ads. That's their acknowledgement that they're aware. Mm -hmm. And I would say mm -hmm. um, it'll take you know, even optimistically up to two years to complete the engineering that will be done by the utilities themselves in several years before the project. I think, how long was a common project? Ten years? Eight years? Start to finish eight years. Eight years. It takes that long. So it takes a while. And all that time, it took almost ten years to accumulate the dollars to offset the cost. Hmm. I mean, I agree with Rosemary. I think it would be really nice to, do, to yeah. have that done. It's <laughs> really, already approved. Really nice. Really punch up means. Yep. Yeah. So it'll happen. It's just it'll happen. It, it happens at in its due time or due course. It's not a it's not, or it's, it's not it's not a quick process. So that okay. that surcharge then is, is applied to every rate payer in North Andover? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask a, a three for three four dollars maybe. So kinda of, kinda of off the wall thought, but so municipalities that have their own munis right that that can that actually operate themselves yep. can do this on their own they, they don't have to go to the utility or they they work with the utility yep. so um, 
so municipalities have that own capacity. Would we be able to do this? I mean, just hypothetically for a second, would we be able to do this work? We could contract it out and I'm do this work. If we were a union, I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah, well, what we do is Even whatever. We're not. No, we cannot do it, buddy, because we don't own. It's, it's we, we can't control we someone else's asset. We I own the asset. I, we don't I, own the asset. I, I understand. If that. we own the asset, if right. that's a hypothetical question, then yeah. it wouldn't matter the resources. We basically would bid it. We'd hire an engineering firm. Okay. We would have hired the engineering firm a year and a half ago. If it took them a year to design the engineering, there's a lot of wires. Look up on Main Street, yeah. right? So if they went through this process of designing mm -hmm. that and it took a year, let's just say for the sake right. of doing it, it sounds a little long, but why not? We'll make right. it a year. Then they would go. We'd make sure we needed the funding to do. They would probably issue bonds through the municipal life uh -huh. plant for the what the cost of the project, which could be between five and ten million dollars, depending on you know whatever the engineering came back at. We'd issue the bonds, and we'd hire a contract like we did for right. building a building, and we would have probably already begun the process. It'd be actively underway, and then we'd you then would raise utility rates to cover the cost of the debt service. Um, you know, if you owned a muni, that's how it that's how it would work. And so yeah, it would be, it would be clearly. Uh, more efficient to do that. Now you have other partners on the poles and dealing with that stuff. You'll have fire line cable and that's mm -hmm. sort of an internal piece. You may have, if it's a national grid pole, there might be Verizon space on the pole. But the coordination and all that stuff would happen. You'd probably hire a project manager who specializes, as we did on the last project at some point. But it, it's certainly the timeline would be much quicker if we own it. Oh, I understand. So, so yes. uh, this may, you know, so just, is there any possibility of approaching that utility and, and working sort of like an, being an outsourced partner. In other words, say, you own the asset, but let us work on your behalf in doing this. You know, can we create an entity that could do that? Well, you know, certainly my, sh my easy answer was no, no but, okay. but I'll try to make it a little, I, I think the, you have to realize that the utility itself doesn't really do it. The utility really needs to be, engage, it will engage an, en an engineering firm to do that work. They don't actually do the construction work, they'll right. bid the construction work. It's just that sometimes when you get, as evidenced by the long report we've issued on power outages, you, you get into a complex, more than local government complex structure of yep. dealing with folks who, who um, it, it's just there's no not a lot of incentive. There's not it's right. Not so, 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 so that, I understand so your they, point though, because are you saying that you you'd want North Andover to take on the responsibility? I of was thinking the same thing. Well, just just the question, just but, just but walking the through the that would be phenomenal. Well, I I, I don't know. I'm just I'm just asking the question, yeah. saying I'll, I'll give you a, the cost of the old center project was about 17 million dollars total to total. The utilities. Well, is Supposedly. there is there any incentive for them? Is there any incentive for us? Is, is there any incentive for the utility, any incentive for us to, you know, kind of spitball that and say, look we, at? We can certainly ask. I think that's sort of what they do. They just do it. They hire the an they, engineer. Well, they they don't. They already, they're not doing this in house. It's all right. third party. So I think the example you would provide is, on the MassWorks grant. It seems like a funny example, but let me. On the MassWorks grant that's in front of the, the new Princeton properties development, we've got $2.7 million in a grant. That's on a mass highway. So it's a, it's a state-funded $2.7 million project on a state roadway. The state basically said, we're going to award you the grant, but you hire the engineering firm, you hire the contract, and we're going to give you the money for the project. And so it was our engineering staff, our contracted engineer that did the engineering. It was our contracted engineering staff that did the bid documents. It's our, it will be technically our contractor that completes the work, even though we're on the property of Mass Highway. That would be your example. But, yes. but remove this, right? Except yes. it's municipality to utility versus municipality to state. Exactly. Uh, we can ask, my, my guess is their answer you know, would be that it, it really doesn't provide them any incentive because they're still going with outside vendors to do the work. It, it's in, so we certainly can ask. I don't think it does in the sense it's still the same thing. We're going to have to hire an engineer, and right. they're not going to allow our, our engineer to touch their asset. Right. It's still going to have to be their engineer. I think that's what they would say. Is it's great that you would do it faster, but when you go hire an engineering firm, they're working for us because then they don't want, from a proprietary perspective, um, they just generally don't. They don't want. Uh, an engineer hired by the town working on their asset. They want an engineer hired by them working on their asset. And, and that's what our experience is. I, I, I just don't, from their perspective, they gain nothing. 
they, that we gain, but they don't gain anything. What would be our gain? Well, well, I'm trying to understand what the benefit would be, just the speed of getting speed. it done? Yeah, right. timing. But there's also part of the statute that says utilities aren't required to spend. They, they're only required to spend what they've collected. So we were very fortunate that National Grid in the old center project um, uh, pledged to continue the work even before not collecting. We had a lot of issues with Verizon and we ended up having to get some CPC funds to finish certain segments of the project because Verizon just wouldn't do it. So the fact that we've been we've sort of reinitiated this in some ways starts to put together the dollars that will align with the sort of engineering piece of it um, and cover those costs. So I, I certainly can introduce it to them. Again, as it relates to a utility, they're really sensitive about their assets. It, they, they would prefer others don't, unless they contract the person, they would prefer others not um, deal with their assets. And so it takes a while. You know, and it's not a super priority to them. They know they'll eventually get it. Um, I don't think they necessarily make profit on it, but they cover their cost on it. And so it, it's, you know, a little less incentive to that. Well, they think, though, that, that, that there's, some, there's value in velocity, right? So, I mean, for us, there is. Well, but for them, too. No, I think there's because they can put more projects. You, you, you can do more projects in this. You know, if you can. No, but but so so put it from this perspective. I'm I have, in and, and fairness. So let me defend the, the utilities generally. They go through this knot hole of having to go through a DPU process to set rates. Those rates do include everything from deferred maintenance to expansion of the existing system and all those things that go with it. I don't think the margins in the utilities are what they used to be. You know, in terms of post deregulation, I think 1978 was the deregulation of the electrical industry in Massachusetts. And so they're competing their own resources. If I take Chris Nobley away from the, if Chris Nobley is a project manager for National Grid, and all of a sudden North Andover's knocked on the door and, and says they want to underground the utilities, and I've got to decide. Chris, you got to go spend some time with that town up in the Merrimack Valley to underground their wires. One, it's not the core part of their business because they don't, they're sort of indifferent to it, right? They, they, they don't money make any money off it. That's not a core part of what they do. Very few communities have successfully undergrounded um, utility lines because they just get frustrated. Read all the internet. They, they get frustrated with the time it takes and all the costs. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm reallocating your resource as a national grid employee to something else. Yeah. And why? What, yeah. What's the rush? So in that case, you, when you're reallocating the resource, unless there's an economic incentive internally to, to, to move you off the project, why am I going to do it? You're busy doing other projects. We're going to put it in the queue. We'll get to it. So I, I'm not saying they're not being responsive. It's just a long process because there is no economic incentive to bring on staff specifically for the purpose or to reallocate what you're focused on onto the north end of a project when they have other competing interests. The only other, and, and I understand, the only other thought I would add to that is I wonder if, depending upon how they take that expense, whether there's an economic, there would be a different economic value. In other words, if that can, it depends upon how you put that on the balance sheet, right? How you account for that cost, that may actually add additional value from, right? So if, if the cost that employee can be offset, by having a, well, it's, it's another discussion, but I, yeah. it just seems to me there's, there's got to be another way to do this, but maybe we're just not in a position to come up with that. Yeah, it, it just, it's... Or do we want to be the trailblazer to do well, it? Well, I don't mind being the trailblazer or anything. Yeah. I think it just becomes when we can control our own destiny as yeah. individuals, as a government entity, whatever it is, and we can create novel ways, and we can give you 10 different examples that we're very good at that as yeah. a municipality, right? But we don't, con it is not our asset. We're asking, we're asking someone else, we're asking our neighbor yeah. to take something in their house and, and change it. Yeah. That's what we're asking. And I know it's a public utility, but it's the closest you know, analogy you can come up to. And then they say, yeah, we agree with you, we're going to do that. We'll get to it. We've got all these other things yeah. we want to do on our property. We don't own this asset. Yeah. We, we pay for it in terms of a service, but we don't own it. Mm -hmm. And so the owner dictates. Yeah. Um, how this is all going to roll out, uh, roll out. And, and largely they have been responsive, they answered our emails, we've had some meetings. It just, there's a process and it takes quite a while. Okay. But, and it was complicated when we did the yeah. The, the only, point, only point I would add to what Chris was especially. saying is the cost of a power outage, which would happen more frequently, I would think, with above-ground wires could be considered, considering we've had such 
power out a lot of power outages. I don't know if Main Street is really the problem in terms of the power outages. Or the utilities it's probably argue, utilities will argue that and we've made that point in the past, especially yeah. the fuel center. They'll argue that unless you're about, if you're undergrounding the entire yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. Structure. Let's do that. It's always above ground. <laughs> okay. yeah, we haven't I had a tree. We've had a tree fall on Main Street, but we haven't had a tree fall as the cause for Main Street. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Yeah. Tree fall. Um, back to selectman yes. comments. Then, do we have any other? Are we done with the uh, ask the manager or town manager report? Any other comments for Andrew or questions? Challenge enough. The challenge is over. Okay. Maybe you can help me okay. just make sure. I believe it's Armed Services Day this weekend at Small Black Farm. It was a Sunday. It's the 15th and 16th, right? Yeah. So and it's a nice Saturday offering for our people who have served. Saturday and Sunday night. And it's all, so is it also police and fire? Is it? Or just, I can't. I don't want to make it. I don't yeah. want to make I it. I think it's just military. military. It's, yeah, it's I think so. Military. Yeah, um, I, tomorrow we have the 9-11 Remembrance here at Town Hall at 9 a.m., yes. mm -hmm. which is a very solemn service that we have every year that the firefighters in the town put on. Um, it's nine, at 9 a.m. in front of Town Hall, but if it rains, it's going to be in the Grand Atrium. The Grand Hall. And also the shows on the Common wrapped up yesterday, I think, and I think they had a great summer's worth of programs up there and again you know can't say enough about the things that go on outside in this town during the summer months it's really phenomenal and through the fall so hope everyone gets a chance to take advantage of some of those things or had taken advantage of them over the summer and the artisan is we actually have a big weekend not right before our next meeting the fall festival is the 22nd on the common being put on by the merchants association and then the next day on the 23rd is the next artisan market on High Street from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I've been told that we have the hayride shuttle going back and forth between the farmer's market. I was just told that we may not have someone who can drive it. Um, so we'll see who we can recruit. Um, and I just I, I wanted to make just one final note about Carrie Crouch because I thought that that was a really, a really neat thing that we did to invite her and recognize her and I think that people at home may have not appreciated just how much all of the things that Regina listed, how much all of those things have impacted the direction of this town and one thing that's worth emphasizing when I think about all the things that have happened on the common especially this summer is these are all town volunteers that do that. Carrie Crouch was honored today not because she was a 40 year employee of North Andover but because she gave 40 years of her life outside of her family and outside of her job you know, to bring us that carnival, to bring us youth services, to bring us the Board of Trade. Um, so I just, I, I know that, I hope there are other opportunities to, to give that family a shout out, but it just, it's a good reminder of how anybody who wants to change the direction of this community really can just by rolling up their sleeves and getting involved. So thank you, Carrie and Ken. And Ken, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're, this is where I mean, Don would have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. I thought there was something else. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.